Well, fentanyl is a, is a good discussion because fentanyl is, a, is, is not an issue we're going to arrest our way through. So policing by itself, arresting bad guys is not going to deal with a fentanyl issue. The community will get on top of fentanyl when it becomes a, an overarching provincial strategy. As you get Alberta Health to the table, you get social services, you get all the different facets there. That there's definitely a, a role for policing to play. There are distributors and dealers and people that need to be arrested, that need to be dealt with, the people that would present that kind of harm out there. There certainly is a role to play there, but all the it's the people that use that are you know, a big challenge. They're the ones that are dying. Mm -hmm. The people that become addicted are the ones that need uh, that attention. But uh, arresting those people and putting them in jail um, doesn't deal with that addiction issue, doesn't deal with all the reasons how they got addicted to start with and how to manage that going forward. That's where you really need an overarching strategy to deal with this. And in my day when we were investigating, uh, it was a smaller team. They were, you know, they're uh, they're able to go out look at an event. You know, it's a lot of case management went on then, but it's box files, folders, and box files, and you know, sort of you know, carrying boxes to court and saying, "Here's my disclosure," and and getting these things before the uh, the justice system. The process of investigation now and the requirements for modern day society is so intense for the amount of detail that has to go on to those investigations. So that same body of work now is probably tenfold in terms of the effort that goes into that. If you think about um, you know, homicides where there's a swarming incident, where there is, you know, they're in a bar and there is a bunch of people poured in an alley and there's an uh, ugly homicide that occurs in that, well there's 30 or 40 witnesses there. There are you know, maybe several different types of accused people or suspects there. They're all carrying multiple devices. They're all carrying uh, um, different ways to record evidence. So we have to seize all those devices. That means a different type of production order or warrant for each one of those devices that didn't exist 10 years ago. And then the forensics to go through those devices to find the evidence we're looking for is time effort that was, wasn't there years ago. So, and that's every crime. That's not just homicide. So homicide is now getting in line with every other crime that has to go through that. If it's sexual assaults or child abuse or or economic crimes, or all these trending now have put pressure on things like homicide that didn't have to vie for those resources before. To, just to get that one matter into court, and then when you have the complexity with homicide now, is then when you're going through that whole process of trying to get all that work done, then you get another homicide. So it's forcing us to rethink our model a little bit about you know, you know partnerships with private industry, with people who can sustain those, that work longer, because we simply can't do this with just a few people anymore. Like This is going to become part of our industry. Cybercrime to me is one of those ones of those understood, least understood environments of, in terms of public safety and public confidence out there. The, uh, like we'll know in Canada this year that we had about 9,500 reported instances of cybercrime. Well, there's not a hope that's the number. Uh, I think with the amount of investment, uh, the economic investment this Canadian society has put into the cyberspace, the fact that there isn't really much presence of the rule of law there is should be a problem for most everybody because the threat actors aren't necessarily people. They're malicious programs, they're, they're people that are in different countries that are, you know, they're attacking us at home and local municipal policing seems to be, have no place in that space. I hate to always say these things because it, sometimes it sounds like it's just a chief one-on-one, but the work that goes on, the people that actually come to work every day to do the things they do, I, I don't think the public really would have any sense of what people, what our officers have to go through every day on a day-by-day -day basis and the sort of work they do. The, it's not for money, obviously. They're not doing it for fame and fortune. The sort of commitment to public safety and excellence is something that you can really you get passionate about, but what really happens. I think that's something you can always hold on to, that the services is, uh, has excellent people and uh, it's just, you know, there's things that never make to the media that you just are, are just so heartening. So that I like, I think that leaves the chief with some, a really good platform for which to build from. I think that that piece, <clears throat> when a community loses that piece, I think you have big, big problems like you saw in, you've seen some of the US models where they've lost complete confidence in the people that work. Calgary is incredibly fortunate to have the sort of people that have been hired in policing and the support they get from the community. I think those are, those are two elements that our community really gets us and supports us and uh, as does the mayor and council and our police commission. Uh, it gives me a great platform. Uh, I'm bothered by, as you are, about the types of violence that we're seeing in the community now. I mean, we talk about innocent people getting 
picked up by rounds. I'm also meaning our officers to somehow respond to a call where they become involved in one of those things and the officer gets hurt. Uh, what we saw the other day from the officer involved shooting is sort of a snapshot at the kind of violence that's out there uh, and the kind of directed targeted attacks at officers and things. And these are things that as a chief you don't want to see. You don't want to see your officers put in unreasonable risks and you know, so we want to make sure we have, we're healthy enough, we're trained well enough, where they get enough rest, they get enough opportunity for, uh, to improve their quality of work. Uh, so they, they make sure they're doing as good as they can.